Welcome to the All About Alts podcast, where we explore the world of alternative investing to help you find financial independence. Join our host, Newview Trust's president, Jason DeBono, as he covers a variety of topics with different guest speakers to discuss tax and alternative investing strategies. It is never too late to start taking control of your financial future, and we are so excited for you to be joining us for this opportunity to hear from some of the best in the business. Welcome, everybody, back to the All About Alts podcast. My name is Jason DeBono. I am your host. And we've got a good friend of mine from uh, back, I don't know, maybe 2015-ish or so, uh, Greg Simpson. Uh, He is a a fellow Floridian over on the West Coast in Tampa. And uh, Greg runs both the Tampa Bay Real Estate Investors Association, uh, which is kind of a cool way to, uh, to really understand the educational component as it relates to real estate. Uh, And then he's also got Outfast Real Estate uh, company. He is a full-time investor as well as uh, a whole lot more. Uh, father of a couple of kids, happily married. So Greg, welcome to the show, buddy. Ah, thanks for having me, Jason. How are we doing? Everything good? Everything is fantastic. We got a happy hour tonight for the company, so we're, we're good to go. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get you on and off and, and get you geared up for that. Uh, you, look, you look more awake than someone with a four-year-old and one-year-old at home. So uh, well, luckily good to for see me. That. The wife and kids are out of town at her sister's house in California. So I have the house to myself besides the dogs. Um, so yes, I am very well rested right now. All right. Well, if uh, as someone with two kids that are a little bit older, if there's any advice I can give you when you're on the road or, or have the house to yourself, you never want to lie to your spouse, but you never want to tell the truth of how great of a night of sleep you got. Right. Uh, make sure that they understand that the dogs were barking and that the neighbors were loud and that the alarm system was making noise and, <laughs> uh, you know, always give a couple of, of good reasons why you didn't get a perfect night's sleep. Mm-hmm. So. Totally. Cool. Well, let's, let's dig into it. You know, I mentioned, uh, the Tampa Bay real estate investor association for those that, that don't know, uh, you know, that ARIA, uh, as the acronym kind of spells out really are educational groups, clubs, associations, uh, for, for lack of better terms, that pull together both aspiring investors right alongside veteran investors. And they tend to meet monthly and, and, and you know, in a, a group setting, but they've got a lot more ways to provide some education. Uh, if you're not part of ARIA in your local area, I'd encourage you to take a look. Um, but Greg, uh, Greg started the TB RIA uh, back in 2015. And so Let's talk a little bit about that, Greg. What was kind of the impetus, um, you know, behind buying the the TB Rea and and yeah, what what's that been like? Yeah, so that was um, I started off as actually a subgroup host um, for the group um, in St. Pete, and uh, I got approached because I was kind of deemed as an up and comer um, in the in the market because um, I was very vocal on social media back when it was still in its infancy ten years ago. Um, and uh, I got recognized and the, the owner at the time was like, Hey, could you, would you like to hope op- open a group in St. Pete? So I did. And I, you know, was really, um, I had taken plenty of uh, public speaking, speak, speaking classes. And, uh, so that was just, it just came natural to me. And then, um, after about a, about a year of doing that, um, he approached me and was like, Hey, would you like to buy the company? Um, and, that's where it kind of came from. But the reason I even got involved in the first place um, was because I had taken a real estate guru seminar. Um, and if, if you haven't heard my story before, I'll make it as brief as possible. Um, Cause it could, we can go all day on this topic alone. But what happened was, is that we went to a free event. They get you to go to a three day seminar um, which was $1,500 for the three day. Um, and in my previous business, I didn't have $1,500 that day, but my dad came with me cause he worked with me and he was like, well, Greg, if you'll do the work, I'll front us the money. I'm like, we, we can go to this three day event. We'll learn a bunch of stuff. I'm like, okay, okay great dad, let's do it. I'll, I'll put the work in, you know me. And so we went to the three day and while there was a lot of great information, I'm not, I'm not kidding. There was actually a lot of really good information in that first three days. The problem was, is that it was just a, also a pitch fest for the three day bus tour out in California. And so we negotiated that down from $25,000 down to $18,000. Uh, Cause that's what I do. And um, I don't pay full price for anything. And, uh, but the, th- the, the pitch was, Hey, 
you need to go call your credit card companies, open up new lines of credit. We can show you how to do it. Um, because you're going to go to this bus tour in California. You're going to learn everything you need to know. And you're going to make money so fast. It doesn't matter if you're putting it on credit cards at 18, 25% interest. It doesn't matter. And we were like, okay, let's do it. And so my dad did exactly that. We put $18,000 on credit cards and we went out to California. And then we threw money on our credit cards for the hotel stay and food at the bar and drinks at the bar. Well, my dad didn't drink, but I drank. And, and then so... The bus tour was a huge letdown though. Um, we did get to go see some really cool houses and get to learn the feel of like, you know, what you should, what a crappy house would look like and then turn it into the beautiful thing. But that was also just another pitch fest for the master mentor program, which was another $25,000, which my dad and I almost came to blows in the hotel lobby. Cause I was very adamant against doing that. I was like, this doesn't make any sense, blah, 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 blah. You know, and um, my dad was adamant, though, and he wanted to do it. So I was like, all right, dad, if you want to do it, it's your money. It's your credit cards. It's your your life. You know, I'll I'll still put the work in. So he did raise the credit card limits again, blah, 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 blah. And long to make the, the long story short, it actually bankrupt my dad because we were not able to do deals fast enough because there was a lot of bullshit on that. Um, a lot of fluff. And uh, so the RIA was a way for me to take the, the knowledge I had did gain from that. But I also gained uh, uh, valuable information from a mentor that uh, I did meet through that organization, that seminar, um, who also thought it was crap. But we learned. I met him, um, and we became friends. And he was my mentor. And TB Rio was a way for me to give back to the the aspiring investors and try to tell them like, you don't need to spend fifty thousand dollars to learn how to do this business. Um, to wrap that up as fast as possible. Um, that's why I do the RIA because the RIA is not a moneymaker for me. It's a, it's a, it is a lead source for me, but it's not a moneymaker for me itself. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate you sharing that story and you know, it's not the first time that we've seen that. And, and certainly, uh, over the years, you know, we, it, it's really hard because good mentorship, uh, can be worth every cent that you pay. And sometimes it's kind of like a college education, um, you know, you can go to a private uh, school and, and pay a premium and, and it could be the best decision you made. Uh, and you can go and pay a premium and come out of there with 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 no real skills uh, mm -hmm. and no opportunity to earn money and realize that, that you just paid a lot of money for something that you'll never uh, see the return on. So, you know, what I always recommend for RIAs is start there. Y you can't go wrong. It, it is going to give you everything you need to know how much and how fast and how uh, aggressively you're willing to invest in your investment career. So, uh, you know, uh, on behalf of, of a student of a RIA uh, for the last 18 years, or, or I should say many RIAs that, that have taught me a lot of great uh, tools, thank you for, for putting in the time and effort and energy because um, there is no real money to be made uh, in, in l small dollar education, which is what the RIAs are. Uh, they're mm -hmm. not designed to be big dollar education. So thanks for what you do there. Um, let's talk a little bit about kind of what are the you know topics? What are you guys today? I mean, the world has changed. I mean, certainly, you know, what you're talking about when, when you started in, in 15 and what you're talking about today have changed. But what are some of the topics, you know, maybe the last few months or, or key areas that have been a focus? And, and let's stick to the RIA side through the RIA um, that, that your uh, members have been either asking a lot or been in need of. Sure. Um, this year, we have kind of had somewhat of a focus on multifamily um, because uh, multifamily has been all the rage the last couple of years with um, a few big players like really being vocal on social media, bigger pockets, Grant Cardone's, um, you know, that kind of thing. We've gotten pretty heavy in that this year with the RIA. Uh, we just had a multifamily panel last month. We have Rod Cleef coming in in a couple of months. Uh, and then we have another multifamily guy coming in potentially later this year um, just to kind of really give people the lay of the land in multifamily. Um, multifamily obviously has changed quite a bit since it became the hot button thing uh, because of interest rates. It have changed a lot of people's refinancing things. But um, if you can still make the deals work now with these high interest rates, dude, when the market shifts back where interest rates drop and you can refinance in three to five years, you're going to get much more than your your standard 18% IRR that everyone's searching for. But that's been kind of our focus this year is multifamily. Um, and, uh, um, you know, 
overall education as well. Like, cause obviously we get a lot of people who come in who want to like get started in wholesaling um, or fix and flipping simply because they, they need, they feel they need to raise their own capital to do deals. Right. Which is, we know is not the case. I mean, I can't tell you, I don't think I've ever put more than like $5,000 of my own money that I got then reimbursed by my private lender from, but uh, long story short, like you don't need money to do this business. You need education and a network. Again, that comes back to the RIA. You learn from people, you get mentors and you then do the, the grunt work and then you yep. find people that have the money to do the deals with. <clears throat> But that's well, you, kind of our focus, yeah. And, and you hit on two things. I want to dig a little deeper on if we can. The the first one was interest rates, and I, you know, I I love that you you highlighted if you can make the numbers work at these interest rates, opportunity is great down the road. Sure. Um, one of the things that that I don't think gets talked about enough is really the interest arbitrage opportunity in real estate. Is a lot of times we think that if you buy real estate and you buy it when interest rates are high you're forever stuck with this high interest rate environment. It's a 30 year mortgage. Why would I ever do that at 7% or seven and a half percent? But you mentioned this refinance opportunity, which is not just for multifamily. This occurs in single family yeah. or any other real estate. So I got three or four of them going right now. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. So, you know, what, what's the strategy behind that interest arbitrage when, when, and what does that look like for an investor, you know, looking to get in the market today and, and let's assume interest rates go down, which I think everybody Believes will happen. Let's not even suggest the time frame, but yeah, we know uh, that, that they'll peak out at some point. Well, I do have a crystal ball, Jason. Well, I can't good. tell you exactly when the uh, rates will drop back <laughs> down, but they will at some point. But uh, yeah, we we use hard money. Like we we do a single family for the most part right now. We're but it's whether it's single family, multifamily, you're buying the properties typically at a much higher interest rate. Whether you're using hard money, private money, um, or even institutional money while you're renovating because everybody if you're buying multifamily that's already turnkey i feel like you're you're doing it wrong you always want to be buying a value add whether it's single family or multifamily so that you can get that appreciation in the bump in two three years however long your rehab process is to then take that property that you bought for cheap cheap renovated it and then can sell it at that higher price so you're refinancing at that higher price hopefully at a low, lower interest rate because if i mean most of my my harder private money is around 10% on the bridge loan, if you will. Um, the short term loan, for those of you who don't know what a bridge loan is, a short term loan, 12, 18 months, two years, three years, whatever that looks like for your lender and your project, you're hopefully going to run it, you know, refinance at a much lower interest rate. Like we're going from 10 on a short term bridge down to about 7.8 to 8.5, depending on the deal, but it's over 30 years. And so our you know, and it's again, it's amortized over 30 years versus it being straight interest only at 10%. So we're getting a much better deal. And then in, in three to five years from now, if the rates drop again, obviously, or not obviously, hopefully the price goes up even more. And then we refinance again in three to five years at hopefully like five to seven, five to 6%. And then we're just taking cash out maybe, or just maybe doing a rate term where we're just refinancing the amount we have left in the deal. Um, but yeah, you have to do it. Everybody does it. And that's the only way that it makes sense to do those deals is the exit strategy on the back end. Absolutely. Well, I, I appreciate you driving that home a little bit more. I, I meet people a lot and they say, you know, I just, I don't know if I want to be buying real estate with rates where they are today. And you know, I tell them it's the one thing that's temporary. Everything totally. else in the purchase, I suppose the property and, you know, its condition, all of those things are temporary. Um, but Interest is so easy to, to get yourself out of. And yes, there's a refinance cost, but it's pennies in comparison to, you know, a percent or two lower on a interest rate financed over 30 years. So the uh, the you had mentioned the, the concept of kind of interest rates. And um, I think that's a fantastic strategy for us to deploy. Let's kind of shift gears a little bit and let's start looking at kind of this value add. Right. You had mentioned value add as an opportunity. Help help our listeners understand what is value add? What does that mean? And and why do you, you know, kind of put your investment philosophy really tied all around value add from an investment standpoint? Yeah. So because I come from the fix and flip and wholesale world to start this business, I just always I can't, and again, I don't buy anything at retail. I cannot I cannot bring myself to buy something that's turnkey. Um, because you're not gonna get the 
you're not going to get the value add, which, which is basically the bump in the value of the property in just a short period of time or even over a long period of time. So we buy everything that is ugly. Everything we buy is ugly. Um, and then the value add prospect or uh, part of that is where we take the property. We, you know, we put a new kitchen in or we put new flooring, we put new roof, AC, the whole, we, whatever we do to renovate the property, you know, just putting fans in rooms can be a value add putting LED lighting in a house versus your old incandescent stuff. Now, again, everything's LED now, but back five years ago, everything, we were still putting LEDs in everything. Um, and that over like solar, solar is now becoming a huge value add now that solar terms have changed. So anything you can do to add value to the property short term or long term is what we look for to make sure that we have equity from the get go. If you're buying a property at, that's turnkey, you're buying it at fair market value today. You're not getting a discount. So if the market shifts down, you're now underwater. And that's what a lot of investors do because they don't have time to do the value add. And I get that to a point, but you should not be the one buying. You should not be buying it if it's not a value add. It just, again, that's my opinion because you're never, you're, if, if the market shifts, you're underwater. But if I buy that property at a, at a 30% discount and I put money into it, I've increased the value of the property as it sits, no matter what. So that property that I bought for three fifty, I put fifty thousand dollars in, is now worth five hundred. Even if the market takes a twenty percent dip, I'm still, I'm still at least, you know, e even. And if I'm planning on holding that property for 10, 15, 20 years, that property is guaranteed, guaranteed at some point in that time frame to go up in value. And then a refinance process a part will happen. And then either cash out or just refinance what I've got already into the deal. And I'm basically had somebody else pay my mortgage for however long. And I got cash flow and appreciation all in one. You cannot do that anywhere else with any other investment on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. Doesn't exist. Yeah, I love uh, yeah, I love talking about kind of comparison to other asset classes. And and there are lots of great asset classes, and there sure. are people that earn really good livings. Um, but, you know, Greg, this is something that that we without question, you know, agree wholeheartedly on is there is no other way for the average American to enter into an investment field, get moderate knowledge and be able to have big impact from a return standpoint. And when you can double dip uh, on both the cash flow and the appreciation and you know, as, as much from a financial standpoint, obviously our new view uh, life, we don't like the word guarantee. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I know. But, but, uh, but I understand completely it's, it's context. And that is, you know, the history of the world has proven that real estate as an asset class will become worth more. Now, it doesn't mean there's not years that it doesn't become worth Correct. less. And there's not properties that have to be decommissioned. And, and all of those things happen. But History uh, and and not just recent history, not even long term history, but forever mm -hmm. has proven that that real estate, if you can hold it long enough, and that's why we're such fans of using retirement accounts for real estate when the deal's right, because you you have a long term vehicle holding long term assets, uh, and that just kind of is a recipe for success. So I'm going to do this, Greg. I want to pause um, sure. and I want to shift gears to our quirky questions of the day, and and then oh, I want to. Uh, dig in a little bit on more your investment philosophy, what you guys are doing, um, some of the strategies you guys have deployed, some Perfect. pretty cool stuff uh, that, that, that I know you guys are doing. So uh, this is our quirky question of the day segment. Uh, for those, uh, our regular listeners, uh, we appreciate your feedback. If you have quirky questions you want to deliver, uh, be sure to email those to Maggie, our producer, uh, at Maggie at NewViewTrust.com. And, uh, and she goes through. So I've got three envelopes to choose from, Greg. I don't know what's in either of them, but uh, no I am going to read these out there. Are three <laughs> I love this. So uh, gear yourself up. Uh, if you hear me chuckling while I'm reading them, it's a good one. I just want you to okay. know. Oh, man, this is a good one. This is, a, I think, a perfect Greg question. Oh boy. All right. Uh, inquiring minds want to know, do you talk to your dog? Of course I do. Does Every he talk day. back? No. Uh, no. Doesn't talk back. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think we all talk to our dog, but, uh, but Greg, maybe you're having, uh, with the wife and kids out of town, maybe more deliberate conversations uh, with them while they're gone. But uh, we won't dig into that, uh, at least not this episode. Um, 
this is a good one. And, and it, you know, it's ironic that, that your wife is out of town um, because this one is, is something that uh, I don't know if you would or wouldn't do whether in town or out of town. But the question is, do you know how to fold a fitted sheet? I do not. I absolutely do not. Uh, that's why when I wash my laundry, I wash it and I throw it right back on the bed. Or my wife does it. I, yep, nope. I tried watching those YouTube videos and I'm just like, nah, that's not for me. <laughs> I'm with you. The strategy, uh, if you pull sheets out at our house, everything's folded to the fitted sheet. It's balled in between everything and kind of pushed down so it looks like it's folded. Um, but there's not any level yep. of effort put towards it. All right. Question three, uh, and we'll get you off the uh, the quirky question hot seat here. Uh, and this is another important one. And, and uh, maybe this morning uh, alone will we'll tell us milk before the cereal or cereal before the milk. Cereal before the milk has to be. Does anybody do it the other way? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people that pour the milk uh, and then add cereal to it. That makes no sense to me, but I guess to each his own. Um, yeah, no, always cereal first. No questions asked. Not even a question, no. Okay, all right. Here's a, a, a question for you. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm now taking the quirky questions and, and adding a little bit to it. I don't know if, if Maggie's gonna yell at me for this or not, but, uh, but I'll take my chances. If you pour a second bowl of milk or a second bowl of cereal, do you drink the milk dry and then start over from scratch or do you add more cereal to the existing milk? So it's, uh, no, I, I definitely add more cereal to the existing milk and then probably add some more on top of it if I want a full bowl. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, that's where I, 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 you hit on the reason I asked the question is because I do add cereal to milk, but it's my second round. And, and mm -hmm. what I don't like is I never can get the cereal to milk ratio right. Exactly. That's so why I would understand why we would put the down. milk in first because you don't know the ratio of how much you're going to eat. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that that is uh, maybe we'll have to strategize on how to to, uh, to to create a bowl that solves that problem in a silk a cereal to go. milk ratio. But uh, Greg, thanks for participating. There's our, there's our billion dollar idea right there. I don't know. That's right. You heard it here <laughs> first. Well, thanks uh, thanks for for indulging our quirky questions and and thanks to those of you. Uh, that are listening out there that continue to uh, to send those in. I, I can't tell you how much of a kick uh, I get out of this. And, and it's usually the first bit of feedback when we wrap up the show uh, and uh, and we're off the mics is usually, man, those quirky questions were all over the place. So uh, you did good, Greg. I think you did awesome. really good today. Thank you, sir. Cool. Well, you know, we talked about TB Rhea. We talked about kind of education, some of the hot buttons that you guys are covering from an educational standpoint for a lot of your members. Let's shift gears and let's talk about Outfast and Greg Simpson, the personal investor. Uh, mm -hmm. This is how you earn a living. This is what you do full time uh, and have for for some time, quite some time. Yeah. Um, so let's go all the way back. And, and what was the transition from now? Greg was an entrepreneur. I'll let him tell his own story, uh, you know, prior to moving into to real estate, which is also really being an entrepreneur. Right. Oh, yeah. um, but. What what caused you to to uh, completely transition full time into real estate? When was that? And what was kind of the the impetus and background behind that? So yeah, I ran a swimming pool service and repair company in Pinellas County and here in Florida, um, where I was born and raised. And uh, again, the reason I got into real estate was because you know we watched the we watched the the, the videos, but this is began before YouTube was a really really big thing. Um, you know, you had to watch TV for the flip this house shows and you, you watch that stuff and you get excited about it. You see the quick money and that's really what it was about in the beginning. It was about making money, um, simply because of, um, the fact that I had met my, my now wife, um, because the pool business was an okay business. I was very burnt out of that business at that time. Anyway, um, I wasn't making a lot of money and I was like, man, how am I going to ever make a living? out of this and provide for, 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 for her and a family in the future. And so like, I just saw that I saw the pool business as a dead end. Um, and so obviously everyone, you know, knows real estate, you can make a lot of money, which is absolutely true. It's not as easy as it's made out to be. Uh, but, but, um, once I finally did a few deals, uh, while I was still running the pool business, I basically had two full-time jobs, if you will. Um, but luckily the pool business did somewhat run on its own with some employees that were very good. I was very lucky to have them. Um, I was able to flip a few houses and make some money. Um, and then I decided I was going to sell the pool business. And actually somebody I met through TB Rhea, uh, used to be a pool service company 
sales broker who used to sell companies that were pool businesses back in the day. And I was like, well, that's freaking awesome. Um, so he helped me sell my pool business. I, I didn't make much money on it, um, but I made enough to buy TV Rhea uh, to start out fast and um, buy myself something nice, which was my new my truck at the time. Um, and because I was driving this beater truck for a long time. Um, and that's kind of the rest is history at that point. Uh, you know, those are my favorite stories to hear, um, you know, is, is how people got started or how they transitioned. And real estate has so many cool stories into the how and why uh, mm -hmm. behind it. And, and it probably in some ways feels like an eternity ago, yet I bet the decision process is still as raw and, and as tough as it was, you know, yeah. uh, the 10 or 12 years ago when you made it. So let, let's talk about um, investment philosophy, right? As you've grown and matured and, and, and have built some assets and resources, you now have a lot more flexibility in the way that you approach the market. Uh, your first few deals were fix and flips, right? How do I get in? Least amount of money, highest impact. Um, so that's the then. Let's talk about now. Um, is that still kind of your, your investment thesis and, and what you're doing each day? So what's changed and, and what are you doing today and why? So this is going to take a little bit too, but I have done well over a hundred flips, like fix and flips in my career. I've done probably another 200 or more wholesales. I don't track this stuff. I'm just going off of memory and, and whatnot. I've done a lot of deals and first and foremost, um, the rehabbing business is very tough. It's really tough. You are it's not as it's not as easy. It's not as glorious as it looks on TV. It is really tough work, and you got to juggle a lot of competition to find the best deals. It's really hard to find the best deals, especially if you're trying to buy from wholesalers or even off the MLS. Like you've got to you've got to have some better strategies for that um, to find the good deals. But I won't go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, that's one thing. It's just really, really hard. And it's, it's, it's stressful. you got, you got other people's money on the line. Um, and it, it, the stress is just really tough. Um, and so the second part of that is taxes suck. They suck on that aspect of the business because it's earned income. It's not investment income. It's short-term capital gains. And so you're paying a lot more in taxes. I remember a guy I met through the rear, I've actually known him for a long time. He goes, he goes, so are you still flipping in wholesale? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, so you like paying lots of taxes. And I go, oh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. This is a long time ago. So I was still stubborn. I was like, ah, I don't care about paying taxes. Blah, blah, blah. And then you start really thinking about taxes and financial planning. And you're like, this is dumb. Like it's a means to an end. Like you may have to start off doing that. I get it. And that's fine. But like, I, I hate it. I I'll actually hate it at this point, Jason. Um, I don't do any fix and flips. I do wholesale a little bit here and there, but only because like I'm doing direct mail or direct marketing to sellers and not everything fits my exact buy box. But that's something I've learned over the years is to really fine tune what I want for my investment strategy for us and our investors and my partners. Like I am very, very diligent at that now before I would be like, uh, it's a two one. I can make that work. I'll flip that house. I'll cause there's nothing out there. Right. Um, and I get that, but then the margins are terrible and there's a reason why that you got a good deal on it. Usually cause there's stuff lurking that you don't see. Um, and your budget went from $80,000 to $120,000 and there went all your profit, blah, 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 blah. So we have really gotten away from fix and flip. Now granted, if a bang and fix and flip deal comes across my desk and it's a no brainer, then yes, I will absolutely do it. Guy says, I want to sell my house for 150,000 and I know I can flip it because it doesn't really fit my buy box for what our next, our new strategy is. Then yeah, I'll make it work. Okay. So don't think guys that, that I'm not going to touch a fix and flip if it comes across my desk. Okay. Um, I'm not an idiot. Okay. I'm not, um, I'm a capitalist at heart. Um, and while I think that flipping is for dummies, um, if you've been doing it in a while, <laughs> Jason Lund, who you know, and I talk about that flipping is for idiots. Um, the judge, you don't know. You just don't know. You don't know the grand scheme of, of owning and holding those rental properties for a long time. So with that being said, we are now focused on cash flow and appreciation, yep. uh, long-term rentals at this point versus the short-term fix. Well, and, you know, and I think it's when you're an entrepreneur, um, it's no different in any business, you know, and, and even if you go back to your pool company days, mm -hmm. uh, the first 20 customers you took on were the first 20 customers willing to do business with you. Thousands. You had no vetting process. Um, yep. And I bet the last 20 customers were probably 
the the best 20 out of the 40 or 50 that wanted to do business with you. So um, it is good. And, and every investor listening today, whether you're aspiring or whether you're a veteran, if you're not shedding some skin year by year and changing the way that one, the market conditions either push or pull you um, because not everything is forced. Sometimes uh, you have to run or lean into opportunity. But two, if you're not looking for ways to graduate out of what you did because you had to uh, or bootstrap because that was mm -hmm. your only way to get it done. Uh, and it doesn't mean that that you no longer look back. And, and I love the fact that you refer to it as stupid or dumb and all those things. Cause it is now, but for someone aspiring, it's not dumb, but hopefully not, one yeah. day they're on the show saying, you know, when I listened to Greg, I thought <laughs> he was dumb. And uh, here we are five years later. And, and now I'm saying it's dumb because I've been able to graduate out of it. So lo love hearing that the, that progression point. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're all, again, our buy box is straight up for, for rental properties only at this point. Now we have a different investment strategy on our rental properties than 99.9% .9 of our investors or investors out there at this point, um, because we are doing something different. Um, it's a little bit newer. It's not a newer concept. It's just a newer way of doing it, if you will. But yeah, we're, we're, um, we're no longer looking at it as straight fix and flip stuff. We're looking all as again, we're doing all value add. So it's, it's almost like still doing a fix and flip, but it's just a different exit strategy. Instead of selling it, we're just holding it, holding we're still making the houses beautiful. Like we're, they're almost flip quality houses that we're renovating. We're not doing your typical, for lack of a better word, a slumlord renovation. Like we're not putting, you know, crap flooring and laminate countertops. We're putting in high end, you know, medium to high end granite, full on nice cabinets, the whole nine yards. Like we're not skimping on the rehab We're our X strategy is just different. It's completely different. Yeah. You know, it, you, it's funny the way you kind of, compare those because you are basically flipping them, but instead of flipping them to a buyer, you're flipping them to a renter. And mm -hmm. your value add now is not just really the value of the property that's critical, but it's the rents. And, you know, what people underestimate, a, a renter is no different than a buyer. Um, you know, if they walk into a house, they want to buy what they want. They want to rent what mm -hmm. they want. And people are always willing to pay more for what they want. And it's just amazing how a few things like granite versus not granite, high end, you know, soft closed cabinets versus older, you know, kind of exposed um, hardware, that stuff may make the difference in either the buyer saying yes or no, or this, the renter saying yes or no, or the renter agreeing to pay full price. So uh, value add is value add, whether you're doing it for the sale or for the rent. What I want to add to that too, is that what's harder Finding the tenant or keeping the tenant. I want my tenant to live in that house forever. Yep. If I find a good tenant, they're qualified. I don't want them moving out. So I don't want to give them any reason to. So if you're doing a half-assed job on your renovation, it will catch up to you. And the it, it, it kills your ROI too. And we can, maybe we can go into that uh, maybe on another podcast, but again, if you're buying a property and you're not going to replace that AC, that's just a little, it's maybe it's just a little bit older than it should be. If that AC goes out, like one of ours just did, and you don't account for that, there goes your entire ROI for three years gone. So like if we're renovating it up front to make it last longer, our ROI is so much better because of that refinance purchase and getting that most of that stuff back. Like we're basically that renovation didn't cost us anything. So if you're going to skimp on your renovation, you're done. Your ROI, your cash flow is gone if that happens. So we we look at it as not only do we want to like have a nice product for them to make the decision to rent from us, we want to keep them there as absolutely long as possible. So we're not having Every, every year, a turnover that takes two to three weeks and then find another tenant that takes another couple of weeks, get them to move in, start paying rent. You're, you're anywhere from three to six weeks before you're back running again. And then your ROI for that year is also mostly yeah. gone. So like there's a whole strategy behind it being, again, being an operator versus an investor and in, in what we do. But like that's the whole point is that like we want to keep those people happy forever. They, we don't want them moving out every year. Yeah. No, or vacancies will will cripple um, a deal. I, I had someone many years ago and, and he said, just, it's very simple. Every month someone's not there, you basically are renting your property at 10% discount for the year. Yep. So if, you do, if you're willing to lose 10% of your rents, literally overnight, uh, mm -hmm. and you go two months, now you're 20% discount. You know, <sighs> So people getting aggressive with rents or people pissing off their tenants for, for the sake of a few bucks, um, 
you know, can have some long term impact without a doubt. Yeah. What um, let's talk a little bit about Tampa. Um, now, I'm, I'm an Orlando guy. Uh, for those that, that don't know, uh, Greg uh, is Greg went to college in Tampa uh, at a school called University of South Florida, which geographically Maybe. doesn't make <laughs> doesn't make uh, any sense. A lot of sense. But we won't <laughs> we won't worry about that. Uh, I'm a UCF guy here in Orlando. We're obviously rivals. But uh uh, I have to say, can you, Greg, can you call it say, right now because you guys have kicked our ass like the last like four or five years in a row. So, you know, I didn't want to say we that. Did, I, we I, did I way around before that. It's, like, it's OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. I appreciate you taking the bait, Greg. Um, but I have to say as much as as uh, you know, I, I, I love talking rivalry from a football standpoint. Tampa as a city has just blown past Orlando, in my opinion, in the last five years. Um, You know, we have attractions and we have Mickey Mouse. We have all these different things. And don't get me wrong, those are fantastic. But the identity of downtown Orlando and the city as a whole is still, you know, a very big distance behind um, Disney and Universal. Yet you Hmm. you take Tampa. Um, I was there about two months or I guess, gosh, two weeks ago at at Tiberia and, uh, You can't even imagine, you know, just not having been there frequently. It's unbelievable. So let's talk a little bit about what's fueling that. It's a lot of investment, man. A lot of investors and developers have taken taken a lot of time and money and invested into the city. Um, I don't know what they saw in Tampa. I mean, we've all kind of seen it. Um, And I've been saying this for a long time. I mean, again, I'm a Florida native. I never really liked Tampa. I was born in St. Pete. I hated Tampa. Um, I actually love Tampa now. I really do. Um, St. Pete is still phenomenal. I still think St. Pete's a little bit better than Tampa, but Tampa has come such a long way. Um, Tampa is now known for, you know, really amazing food. We've got several Michelin restaurants now here in downtown. But the thing that I always hated about Tampa, uh, Jason and listeners and watchers, is that Tampa never had a great downtown. It was always just places for people to go to work. Like it was just, you know, a few high rises and it was literally, there was no restaurants to go to, to speak of. They were all the fast casual stuff for the people working in downtown. Now they've got brand, they've got a lot of more mixed use uh, downtown, which is amazing because that didn't exist before. Now we have probably five to seven humongous condos and apartment buildings that are all mixed use and they have a amazing food and restaurants and, and, and uh, things downtown now. And also like on water street of, uh, you know, Jeffrey Vinnick, the owner of the lightning and bill Gates and a few other investors and developers have thrown billions of dollars, billions of dollars in into downtown Tampa to redevelop it. And it's awesome. Like I went down for lunch at a, a place I'd never been last week. I don't even remember the name of it. Very bougie place. It's not usually my style, but it was, I was like, my goodness, this is amazing. Like, I don't even recognize downtown anymore. And I've lived here for the last 10, 12 years. Um, It's wild. It's just wild. Um, But yeah, it's just, it's again, it's like anything. They they just do it on a much bigger scale than we do. Um, They made downtown, which was junk. They threw a bunch of money at it. And now it's gorgeous. And everybody wants to come here now. Now, we don't have the attractions as Orlando and in the Disney's and stuff like that. So um, while I am very bullish on tampa as a whole i am scared if the market does shift quite a bit that we don't have mickey mouse here to to stabilize us versus orlando we'll still have plenty of people still coming to to disney i don't see that being a thing like where i I don't think that i'm not saying that anything is recession or correction proof um but tampa with the amount of money that's been here and honestly honestly having tampa uh uh, tampa win several championships with uh, tom brady um and also the lightning winning back to back and being in three straight uh, Stanley Cup sure as heck didn't hurt the uh, the exposure that Tampa got during yeah. COVID in, in that time frame because everyone was like, well, let's go to Tampa to check it out. And everyone fell in love with it. And yeah, Tampa's phenomenal. And I I, I do love Tampa now. Now they, they really have done a great job. I, I think it would be the a, a prime example of a value add city. Um, yeah. You know, it was uh, you got asked it. at that lunch. It was like, "Hey, do you see Tampa being the next Miami?" And I was like, "I don't know if I'd go that far, but I definitely was like, I think it could be the next Orlando, where it's like, you know, Orlando spiked, um, and it's now Orlando's massive now. It's like the development has just gotten so big in Orlando yeah. that you got, you know, so many huge out, you know, areas outside of Orlando, just like Tampa. Now all these different developments have happened outside of Tampa because Tampa grew, and they, you know, we can't, we still can't keep up with the amount of demand here." So that's going to be interesting. That's why I feel like it's fairly recession proof. We still can't keep up with the demand for housing here. Well, Florida, 
you know, as a whole is, is, um, you know, certainly one of the, 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 um, states that was a big winner in, in the COVID sweepstakes. And, sure. um, you know, that that's not going away. And as remote work continues to be an opportunity for people, uh, they're looking at different states. And, uh, you know, I'm a Florida native as well. And it's pretty hard, uh, you know, when when people ask about Florida and I tell them what we you know what we pay for our houses, what our houses look <laughs> like, how long it takes me to be parked on a beach or or yeah. on a boat on a lake, uh, the zero state income taxes. And then you can now finally, regardless of, of the, you know, the metro you're in, we can talk about winning sports teams and, and some uh, a lot more, you know, performing arts and all these other things that historically really we didn't have. And those things do matter to people. And they're going, wait a minute, I can go down to Tampa and be a, a, a lightning fan and I can go cheer for the Bucks and I can, you know, watch the Rays play and I can do that all at the beach while paying no state income tax and I can pay 30 or 40 percent less for a 30 or 40 percent bigger house. You know, it only takes a few of those things for someone to go, hmm, this yep. starts to look and and feel a lot like the right thing to do. Yeah. And all their friends are telling us or, you know, like, oh, my gosh, you're moving to Florida. What do you why? And then they're giving the same exact examples you just gave. And they're like, hmm, maybe I should do the same thing, too. That's right. You know? No, oh, it's uh, it's been really nice, and it's it it has really created a lot of opportunity. And you mentioned kind of these secondary and tertiary markets um, outside of Orlando and outside of Tampa, and even outside of Miami. And and then you look mm -hmm. at Southwest Florida and Jacksonville, and Jacksonville. You know, it's it's uh, it's amazing. The opportunity is is endless. That's for sure. Let's uh, let's transition. Uh, I got a couple questions in in a quick lightning round. I want to uh, I want to address a couple of them are. Are, are very critical. Uh, they're, they're weighing very heavy on me. So, uh, Greg, I need these answers uh, from you. So um, we will fire away with our, our lightning round here. Question number one, what's the best investment you ever made? Ooh, good question. Right now, um, best investment I ever made is actually a house that I own now. Um, we just bought it a few months or like six months ago. It is now cash flowing at near $10,000 a month. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a great property. We can maybe follow up with that afterwards. So, yeah, I like that one. That's certainly going to be uh, when when the mics go off uh, uh, a little <laughs> bit further. Question uh, behind that. Question number two: If you could go back ten years, right to to young Greg, uh, you know, wet behind the ears, buying TB Ria, fresh off of of uh, uh, the the credit card um, uh, charging story. And you could go back and kind of do stuff differently or do something differently or give yourself some advice. What would it be? Um, the advice would be what actually what Rod Khalif gave me um, when I had him on my podcast in 2019. He was my first ever podcast guest on our Outfast podcast. And to get Rod Khalif was pretty, pretty ridiculous. But um, he said, how many wholesales you did? And I was like, I better remember. He's like, don't you wish you should have kept or don't you wish you would have kept a bunch of those? And I said, Again, it was one of those other gut punches. So I wish I'd have bought more properties for rentals back when I was selling wholesale. I mean, I remember selling wholesale deals in Tampa for fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, in two thousand twelve sure. and thirteen, fourteen. I'm like, imagine what that they would be worth today. Yeah, yeah. I think we'd all have bought a whole lot more and, and invested uh, a little bit longer. Um, but uh, but you know, it uh, it's those. Uh, things that we learn through the process that, that continue to make us better investors. And, um, you know, we left a little bit of meat on the bones, but, uh, but that's okay. Um, all right. Question three in the lightning round. Most important. Is USF going to beat UCF this decade? This de Yes, probably this decade. It may be just once, but yes, this decade we will be, beat them once. at least. All right. Now I, I need to know, did you glance <laughs> down at the crystal ball for that? Or, or, or are you, uh, you making that comment from your heart? Just from the heart. That's that's uh, just because right. I'm a fan, and I have to I have to at least give them some credit. You know, luckily for me, I'm also a Florida State fan because uh, my dad went to Florida State, so I've had some Florida State luck the last couple of years because they had a pretty rough patch too. So, um, yeah. but yeah, luckily for me, I'm okay. All right. Well, you're uh, you're you're you you heard it here, everybody. Uh, USF will beat UCF uh, at some point this decade. So, uh, looking <laughs> forward to uh, each year reminding you or you reminding me. Uh, as to who is right uh, on this. So, um, Greg, I, I appreciate you jumping on uh, on Thanks, the man. lightning round. Um, I've got just a, a kind of one more question, and then I want to wrap up with the learn before you burn um, here in a second. But um, what, what looking out, you know, you you have a very unique perspective, Greg. You know, very few people are on both 
the full-time investment side, right? You roll your sleeves up, you've been there, done that, but you're also an academic, right? You're on the educational side as well. And so you're not teaching theory, you're teaching experience. Um, just a quick, you know, uh, uh, wrap up here. If you were kind of to an audience and our audience ranges from, you know, uh, novices to experts to aspiring investors. Uh, and we really try to highlight two things, right? We try to highlight, um, you know, making sure that, that people are, are making, uh, the best of their investments and investing into whatever the market allows, not just, you know, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And then something we didn't really talk about today, but that's tax efficiency. And, and you kind of hit on it with some of the the drawbacks to to fix and flips, right? And and certainly doing those in a Roth IRA uh, changes that completely. So you know we can dig deeper on that in another show on on the tax side and how to make that less painful. But you know what are you seeing? What's kind of your just hey? Let's wrap this show up with uh, a little bit of anecdotal context uh, from the academic and the hands on side. Yeah, so I'm actually going to re I'm going to go back to lightning round. I'm going to re uh, answer something differently. Yes, that investment is awesome, and it's going to pay me a lot. Me and my partners and investors a lot of money. However, going back to the educational aspect, the best investment I've ever made is in myself. One thousand percent. It does. It, real estate. It doesn't matter. Again, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever your investment strategy is, the best investment you'll ever make is yourself. Um, I want to be very, very clear about that. And that doesn't get you. Don't get to invest in yourself if you're not willing to invest in education. Um, whether that's investing in education with a monetary dollar fixed amount to it or if that's time uh you can watch youtube videos and get a lot of decent information i'm not a big fan of youtube for learning the real detailed information of stuff everything on youtube i've ever seen is always super super high level to get that granular education the only way you're going to get that is one you pay for a mentor or a real coach like a really good coach or two you go be somebody's mentee and you do everything that mentor tells you to do. I mean, and not question it. You may question why you, he, he or she asked you to do that after you've done the thing, but don't question the method. And that's one of the big pet peeves I've always had is like, well, why would you make me do that? It's because I said so, because I've been there, done that. Just trust me. And if you try, if you, do that too much. I'm, you're not going to be a mentee for me. Um, but, but that if you don't have money to go spend on either a, a really great coach, coach or a mentor, I should say a coach because mentors don't charge anything. Let's be clear here. Mentors don't charge anything. Right. Coaches charge stuff. If you can't afford a coach, go find yourself a mentor. Um, but literally just be, you sh if you want to come learn a bit from me, come sit right here in this chair and just watch me every day. And that's what I mean by if you don't have the money, go just be a sponge for somebody and be around that person and learn from them that way. Does that make sense? No, it most certainly does. And, and you know, we talk about education all the time and there, there's no excuse to be ignorant in today's world. Um, no not. excuse. And I, 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 I think you nailed it with if you don't have the money to go spend or you have it and you don't want to, the alternative is to find someone that you, that has been there, done that, and take their advice. It uh, as cliche it is, as it is, it's the old Karate Kid approach, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's he certainly we, didn't want to paint the fence and wash the floor and all these other things. But there was a method to the madness, and any good mentor, um, you know, is not here to have you count paper clips for the sake of it. They're there to teach you lessons that allow you to make the right decisions on a go forward basis. Hundred percent. And the thing that's like. We have people, obviously, they, they come to me. It's like, I, you know, they, they ask me, how should I get started? It's a three-pronged question. It's like, do you have money or do you not? Do you have time or do you not? And are you willing to put in the work, right? So I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because we're trying to wrap up everything here today. But like some people that come to me that have money, they want to learn along the way. So like if you're going to invest with us in our company or in deals, you're more than welcome to come check out the properties anytime you want. Again, they just need to come follow me around. I'm not going to go, hey, by the way, I'm going to the house today. Um, you just kind of have to follow around. And it's yeah. we, we are, we're open with our investors. If they want to come learn the process along what we're doing, by all means, come do it. Um, but yeah, it's you've got to learn to earn, but you also have you still have to take the action. And that's the thing that's one of the most frustrating things with owning a RIA is that if you guys are learning to wanting to learn, you better go do the work. That's right. Doesn't do you any good to learn because we, uh, Tony Robbins, one of my coaches, mentors, whatever you want to call him. He, uh, you know, his big thing is take action, you know, action cures everything. Yep. And 
people go to his seminars all the time and they don't take action, but it's his big stick is take the action. Yeah. Well, Tony and, and everything he says is spot on and uh, mm -hmm. action is key. And, and I think you, you gave uh, fantastic advice to the listeners. Um, just put in the work uh, results will follow at some point. Um, which takes us to the last segment uh, of, of the show. Uh, this is the Learn Before You Burn. This is where we help our listeners get the lesson without the experience. So, you know, Greg, what do you got for our listeners today? What what have you learned in the course of your career that uh, that was painful, but the, the lesson with, along, alongside the experience was worth it in the grand scheme of things? What's your Learn Before You Burn? Uh, uh, the Learn Before You Burn is know that there is more money out there than you ever imagine. Go find deals and the money will follow. I was told that a long time ago, but I didn't believe it. And then you start doing some deals, the money will follow. So like, don't ever let that be a limiting belief that there's not enough money for you to go find out there to do your deals. It's everywhere. It's actually Absolutely. everywhere. Um, so yeah, that would definitely say that one for sure. I love it. I absolutely love it. The money is there. Go find it. You find the right deal. The money will find itself. So Greg, thanks so much for, for being here. Uh, always appreciate your wisdom. Good to catch you up and, and have a little bit of fun. Um, Greg, we'll, we'll throw uh, the TB RIA uh, information and contact information in the show notes, as well as if you're comfortable with it, uh, we'll, we'll throw uh, your personal contact info into the show notes. If you guys want to reach Greg, uh, I can encourage you if you're in the Tampa area, certainly go, go join him at TB RIA. If you're not in uh, Tampa, go to uh, uh, the National Real Estate Investor Association um, website. You can find all the local RIAs or search the local RIAs in your community. They're fantastic. Education is king. Uh, and it's all right there, readily available to you. So, uh, Greg, any last words of wisdom as we part? No, man. I mean, just, you know, just take the action, guys. Like, there, whether you're wanting to get started in one way or another, go do it. And real estate, in my opinion, is always going to be the best. Go do it. Go do it. Go do it. Greg, good to see you, buddy. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, everybody else uh, joining us on the call today, thank you. Uh, if you're not currently subscribed, please click the like, share, subscribe button. Uh, if you like what you heard, make sure that you give us a, a five-star review. That helps us build our community. Uh, we're just here to continue to bring on uh, great content uh, and help educate the marketplace on really buying investments that that are outside of the Wall Street world and realm uh, and to do it in a tax efficient manner. So Greg, thanks for your knowledge and wisdom today and everybody else. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for listening. We hope the information within this podcast has given you the tools that you need to find your way to financial independence. We would love to partner with you on this journey. Text ALTS, that's A-L-T-S to 407-708. 1853 to learn more about how to get started today. Don't forget to follow us to make sure you don't miss a second of content and we'll see you next week.